Welcome online family, we're glad you're here. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our content. Also, head over to the App Store and download our TFBC app where you can check out all of our events. You can leave prayer requests for us. You can also follow our sermon notes as we give the message each week. Speaking of messages, we got a great one for you today. So let's dive right in. Well, would you turn your Bibles to uh, the book of 1 John? Uh, turn your Bibles to 1 John. That's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're going to be in uh, chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 5. And we're just going to do uh, all the way down to uh, chapter 2, verse 2, if the Lord gives us time to do that. Uh, I actually don't know what time I'm supposed to be done, so you're just going to have to deal with it for a little bit. Um, you can say stuff, but I won't hear you. But if you start walking out, my eyes still work. So as soon as someone walks out, I'll be done. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> you ever have a grandfather type figure in your life? You ever have a, a grandfather or a grandmother, someone just wise in years who uh, you've just sat down, maybe they sat you down, they teach you the way of life, they, they really sit you down and give you some wisdom, and as a young person, you just look at them in awe going, yeah, whatever you say, I, w- I want to hear. I, I hope you have or had had someone like that in your life. That is John here in 1 John. John writes 1 John, he writes this letter uh, to the churches because he is concerned about what is going on with the next generation of Christians. He's going to sit them down. He is likely, in fact, most likely, the last disciple alive as he writes 1 John. 1st and 2nd and 3rd John are some of the last letters written in the New Testament. It has been 40 years since the Gospels of Matthew and Mark were written. 40 years had gone by since those books were written. And it's been about 30 years since the Gospel of Luke was written. So John writes his gospel. John is so unique compared to the other three for a lot of reasons that we can't get into today. He writes John, and then he writes these letters. These are some of his last words. So why should we listen to him? Well, as the last remaining disciple, he's seen all of his friends die. He's seen all of these eyewitnesses, these apostles, and these servants die for the gospel, die for the message of Jesus. And now... The first generation of Christians is getting older, and the second generation Christians are now growing up and taking over the leadership. And he's so concerned that they get it right. He doesn't want them to get it wrong. We should listen to him for a couple of reasons. Number one, because he is a firsthand eyewitness. If you've ever been on a jury before, I've been on three, um, and every time I get jury duty, I ended up on the jury. I don't know how every time, everyone else gets dismissed. I don't know how you guys do that. But for me, I've, I've been on jury uh, three times. Eyewitness testimonies are important. When the judge says, okay, an eyewitness is coming up, it's like, pay attention. This person was there. The jury wasn't there. The attorneys weren't there, but this eyewitness was there. So pay attention. And so that's what John is for us. In fact, look at that in the chapter 1, verse 1 of this book. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands. He's saying, I've physically held Jesus' hands concerning the word of life. This is an eyewitness. First person eyewitness. We as Christians can rest assured that the Bible contains eyewitness testimony to us today. That's why our Bibles are so precious. Number two, there's another reason why we should listen to John. is because he was commanded by Jesus himself to proclaim what he heard and what he saw. Remember the Great Commission. Jesus t- tells them to go, to go and make disciples, to baptize. It's concerning all the things that Jesus taught them to go and now do. So this is not just an eyewitness, but this is an eyewitness on a mission. And this is someone that we should listen to. And number three, he is on this mission. He aims to correct some serious problems going on in the land at that time. In the first century, Gnosticism was rearing its ugly head, which is an understanding that you would have special knowledge in order to have a special relationship with God. So, so maybe you can't know who God is because I have the special knowledge and you don't. And this was, was really ugly, and I think John is perceiving that this is going to make its way into the church, and it shouldn't. It's not about a knowledge of God. It's about a relationship with God. So he's reminding them that this is not just a uh, give your brain to Jesus, right, which is just give your knowledge to Jesus. No, this is give your heart to Jesus. This is a relationship. Gnosticism was saying you can give God your brain, but you don't have to give him your heart. 
So you have these people who proclaiming that they had this relationship with God or this uh, understanding of who God is, but then they could do whatever they want on Friday night. And John is saying this is not so. So this is an eyewitness on a mission to correct some critical errors in the early church. And this morning, this eyewitness is going to teach us about the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of God's love. And I titled this, the passage pretty cheesy. This is just my favorite passage. I was thinking, okay, my first uh, sermon as a pastor here at TFBC, what is it going to be? It's going to be my favorite one. So the, this is the passage that I just love, I enjoy, and so I just wanted to share it with you this morning. Now, in the first century, they, they had a low understanding of sin. They just did whatever they want. And guess what? It's happening today in the 21st century. We live in this very similar land, not just in Tulare or not in California, but in our entire country. And I would say even this entire world has no understanding or has an incorrect understanding of sin today. We live in a culture that does not want to address sin, right? They don't want to call it out. We live in a society that tries to redefine sin. We live with people who try to belittle sin and just call it a mistake, say it's no big deal. And sometimes we hypocritically live in a society where we call out sin while, leaving in secret, while living in secret sin ourselves. We have a sin problem here in this world. And John is here today, this morning, to help address that. R. Kent Hughes, one of my favorite authors, he wrote a book called Disciplines of a Godly Man, Disciplines of a Godly Woman, Disciplines of a Godly Family. I love his, his writing. Him and his wife are great authors. He said this about sin this morning. Today's culture has changed the label on the bottle called sin and falsely assumed that it has changed the contents of the bottle. A rose by any other name would still smell as sweet. But sin, by any other name, still stinks to high heaven. We as a society have banned sin from our vocabulary, but not from our veins. Bulletproof windows, 12-inch steel doors in banks, jails, police cars, and your key ring bear mute testimony to the fact that people are still sinners. You lock your house, your, house, your car, your office, locker, and luggage because people still can't obey the eighth commandment, you shall not steal. So that's what John is trying to get at this morning. He's going to make two claims as an eyewitness. You're going to see two claims today, which if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you the blanks uh, for free. Number one is that God is light. And number two, toward the end, at the end of this sermon, he's going to say, but God loves sinners. And you're going to see all throughout this passage a whole bunch of ifs. You're going to see all of these ifs. And you're going to see all of, these, all of these sins all connected together. So pay attention to that repetition. That's what John is going to be talking about this morning. And the best way to get serious about sin is to get serious about our salvation. If you're someone who's serious about, about battling sin and, 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 and saying no to sin when it tries to rear its ugly head, the best way to do that is to be serious about your relationship with God and your, about your appreciation for what he has done to save you. But who here, you don't have to raise your hand, who here has ever not taken something seriously and you had to pay the consequences for it? I have. Knucklehead Jeremy here. I've done that. Um, it, when I was 19 years old, and, uh, our church was growing and a Saturday night service was being, uh, we, was being created because our Sunday services, we were up to three now and they were jam-packed. We, it, was, it didn't make sense to add a fourth. And Lancaster being a commuter city to Los Angeles, we thought, you know, it'd be great to have a Saturday evening service for anyone that may need to work on Sundays. Uh, so we did a Saturday night service. And we added this youth class. And I'm 19, and I'm the, like the youth intern, so my youth pastor says, Jeremy, will you take this class on? You're going to be the new youth guy on Saturday nights. I was super pumped. Um, but also at 19, I was super unorganized. And I worked at In-N-Out Burger at the time. Uh, I was living in an apartment. I was working at two jobs, uh, trying to make bills happen. And I said, sure, put me in, coach. And I was excited. I really wanted to be a youth pastor, and I thought this was a, a chance uh, for me to, to prove myself, a chance for me to develop and to grow and to learn. Well, the first Saturday was coming, and it was coming quickly. And I had months, mind you, to prepare for my very first sermon that I was ever going to give at 19. And I put it off, I put it off, I put it off. And then I woke up Saturday morning going, oh, I'll just do it after I get off work today. I worked from 9 to 2. Well, uh, at in and out, and I thought, oh, I have plenty of time from 2 to 5 to get my sermon done. 
three, you know, if you preach, three hours is not enough to, to preach from God's um, amazing word. Well, unfortunately, our in and out was right next to a movie theater, and Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire came out. And anytime one of those movies came out in the middle 2000s, the restaurant parking lot was packed. We were slammed. Everyone going through the drive through My boss looks me dead in the eye and said, Jeremy, you're not getting off at 2 o'clock. You're, you're working until 5. And I was like, okay, Lord, be with me. Uh, I had a half an hour. I worked uh, more than eight hours, so they had to give me a half an hour break. And I thought, okay, well, at least I have 30 minutes. I don't have a laptop at in and out so I grab one of those in and out lap maps that they give you, which ha- I don't know why we ever hand those out. We, everyone just crumples those things and throws them away. But I took one of those lap mats, I took a pen, and I wrote my, ser- my whole sermon on this lap mat. And then I, I was like, okay, well, I got something. And by the way, this is the first one ever. So I get to the class, I have fun with the students, do a little icebreaker. We have one of our students who uh, did a couple of worship songs. And then I go up to preach with this lap mat. And I'm just holding it up like this. There's like a, a burgers on the other side. And I'm preaching and I'm just going, yes, and this is what Jesus has told you to say. All right, I'm doing all of this. My youth pastor's in the room the whole time. He wanted to come and watch my first ever sermon. He was very proud. He was excited for me. And he sat me down afterwards. I don't remember much of the conversation. <laughs> sat me down, Jeremy, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this for a living? do you really want to change people's lives? Then take this seriously. And it was, I needed to, it was the hardest conversation for me to ever have, but it was the best one that I could ever have. It whipped me into shape quickly. Because here is this man who really, he helped lead me to the Lord. He helped disciple me and I, I disappointed him. And even on a bigger scale, I was just humiliated that God, I, I did not treat this as God wanted me to treat it, I treated it with such arrogance, thinking, oh, I can knock out a sermon in 30 minutes. And it was a a huge day for me because I failed miserably. But thankfully, uh, by God's grace, um, I got second chances. And I haven't looked back ever since. And that's what happens when you don't take something seriously. When you don't take something seriously, you fall flat on your face. And this morning, church family I'm going to remind all of us, encourage us to take sin seriously. Today, John is going to have that conversation with us. He's going to tell us how to get serious about sin because God is serious about sin. Claim number one, God is light. All right, let's finally get to the passage this morning. Look at verse one. This is John. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. When John says that he heard from Jesus and now proclaims to us, that is a big thing. What proclaiming means here is to herald important news. This isn't John just like hanging out and and saying every once in a while, hey, do you want to give your life to Jesus? No, he is proclaiming this. This is his life mission. Everywhere he's going, he's trying to do this. And he probably saw, actually I know he saw, John the Baptist, who is a different John, do the same thing. Remember in in John chapter 1, we don't have time to turn there this morning, but in John chapter 1, Jesus and John, their paths cross, and John, in the middle of conversation with his own disciples, he probably goes like this and says, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. It's the same thing. It's proclaiming. He's proclaiming this important news. And that is John this morning. He's saying God is light. That's what he's saying. He's saying God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Why is John using this descriptor, light? Why is, out of all the descriptions that you can give to God, why is he saying God is light? Because, again, as an eyewitness, he is simply doing what Jesus is saying. And in John chapter 8, when Jesus is at the festival of lights, he tells the Pharisees, he tells the crowd and his disciples, Jesus does in John 8 verse 12, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's telling everyone at, the, at this festival of lights, hey, listen, it's not about the candles that you're doing. I am the light. It's not those things. I am the light of the world. And you, if you walk in me, if you follow me, you will no longer walk in darkness. 
That's what Jesus came to do. So that's why John is using this descriptor. The phrase God is light refers to the moral perfection of God. What John is trying to claim here this morning is that God is absolutely perfect. And that's what Jesus was proclaiming as well. That's why we can worship Jesus because Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. He's so perfect, he has no dark spots, nothing to hide. He is light and there's no darkness in God whatsoever. David Allen, a commentator, says, In him is no shade, speck, or stain of moral imperfection. In him is no fault, failure, or falsehood. In him is no deceit, deviation, or dishonesty. Now many of us Christians in the room would say, well, this is pretty obvious. We know God is perfect. But as Christians, we need this reminder frequently in our lives because we don't always live like he is perfect. R.W. Church says, how often do we as Christians sin, hoping that God will not think so severely of our sin as the Bible says he does? How often do we flatter ourselves with excuses for our sin, such as God is merciful, he won't be hard on me. Surely he does not expect me to always be holy and self-denying. I'm afraid we sometimes rationalize and delude ourselves into thinking that God can be bargained with, bribed, or otherwise bought off concerning our sin. Because God is light, he takes sin seriously. Have you ever met a Christian who does not take sin seriously? Whose walk doesn't match their talk? They're talking about Jesus all the time, but then you're seeing their way of life going, ah, something's not adding up here. R. Kent Hughes says, talk and walk go together in the Christian life like two wings on an airplane. There is a huge gap between cheap talk and an authentic walk. And as Christians, we need both. You cannot have one wing without the other. We talk about Jesus. We need to walk like Jesus. That is the great challenge that we have today in front of us. We take our relationship with God seriously, and it starts with taking sin seriously. Let's look at these four if-then statements that help take, us, take sin seriously. An if-then statement, oh, by the way, uh, I took, I'll, I'll get there in a minute, actually. If we cover up our sin, here's what he's saying. If we cover up our sin, then we make things worse. Look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, there's the if. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. When I was in school, I took a, a computer programming class and at, the, at the local community college. I don't remember much about the class, but I do remember this fun project where we had to learn how to run a business, and we had to code and, and do pr- computer programming, and we had to use if-then statements. That's what we learned. And we learned, if you do this, then this will happen. You're trying to do this. And my friends, they all got like really cool jobs like, because you were assigned to these jobs like burger stand and movie theater and arcade. I got library. I was so bummed. I was like, oh, this is my chance. So I remember I was like, well, this library has to make money somehow because all these other guys are like, they're doing all this because that was the goal is to make money. You can't make money at a library. This is a nonprofit. So I wrote, <laughs> if the book is due after this day, or if the book comes after due date, then charge $1,000. That's what I was doing. That was my chance. You do not want me to be the librarian of this town. Um, but that's what was going on. Now, that's how um, programming works. They're called conditional statements. That's what an if-then statement is. And we're going to look at four if-then statements. And what John is saying is, if you cover up your sin, if you, if you try to cover it up, then you'll make things worse for you. Isn't that true? Who here, I'll raise my hand, who has ever tried to conceal sin and realize, oh, it did not work out for me, right? It just never works out. If you pretend to have fellowship with God and put on a show of relationship with him, but then continue to sin and let it have its ugly way with you, then you'll not help yourself. You'll make things worse because you'll sin more to try to cover it up. You'll continue to lie. Remember David did this with Bathsheba? He sins with Bathsheba, and then instead of immediately confessing, he has Bathsheba's husband thrown into the front lines of the war. He ends up dying. He made things worse because he tried to cover up his sin. That is someone who is talking the talk, but clearly not walking the walk. Remember, I preached this back in March as a guest preacher uh, in John chapter 3. Remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus? 
And Jesus says, for everyone who, in verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. It's impossible as Christians for us to cover up our sin, but then to simultaneously say, I'm continuing to walk in the light. That's the first thing. So if we're going to get serious about our sin, let us not try to cover it up. But instead, you'll see in verse 9 and here in a little bit, you'll see what we should do with it instead. All right. If then statement number two. I will, I'll go through these quickly. If then statement number two. <clears throat> if we take sin seriously, then we enjoy the benefits. First John chapter 1 says, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We know that we cannot not sin, right? I remember being a sophomore in high school, brand new Christian, you know, year in, I was like, you know, between my freshman and sophomore year that summer, I was like, I'm going to go to school, I'm never going to sin again. Like, I was just like so pumped for this little challenge I gave myself, like, I'm going to wake up, I'm not going to sin. I was trying to do that every single day. That would last like two minutes, 30 seconds, right? Eight minutes. I was like, oh, I'm just going to, okay, I'll start again tomorrow. Right? We cannot not sin. We, we still struggle with sin here today. Perfection is in heaven, and I cannot wait to get there. One of my favorite things about heaven is that I'll no longer sin. I'll no longer sin against my family and friends or people, and instead I will also then also no longer be sinned against. I cannot wait for heaven for that. The harsh reality here on earth is that we still battle with sin. It's impossible to not sin here on earth. We still do it. So what is John implying here? He's not talking about being in a sinless condition. He's talking about a heart direction. The key difference between the first statement and this statement is where the person is walking. You're not walking in darkness. If you walk in darkness, you'll have no fellowship. If you're walking in the light, you'll have fellowship. So how does one walk in the light? Two very quick practical things. One is read your Bibles. We're in God's word. Read our Bibles and do what it says. Remember Psalm chapter 119 verse 104 or 105? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. The best way to see what's in front of you, the best way to be able to identify sin is to shine a light on it. And the best way for that to happen is to shine the scriptures on it. If you're camping in the middle of the night and it's pitch black, which is one of my favorite things is just to watch all the stars with no light pollution. It's amazing. You look at God's creation. It's Psalm 19. But you know if you have to go out to go to the bathroom or go do something, you realize you need a light in order to see. The world is filled with darkness and we need a light in order to see. And the Bible is our flashlight. Number two, we also need to love Jesus. The best way to walk in the light is to read our Bibles, do what it says, and just to love Jesus and, and, and desire to do what he says. John chapter 14, he's in the upper room. He tells his disciples in verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Did you guys catch that? It's, that's an if-then statement as well. If you love me, then keep my commandments. Have a, have a heart posture of saying, God, you're, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my master, and I just want to do what you say. That's what Christians ought to be doing. Loving Jesus motivates us to love him and to do what he says. Loving Jesus helps us to hate sin because Jesus hates sin. Back to this statement. <clears throat> if we walk in the light, two results. This is, this, maybe this is a challenge for us, a litmus test for us. If you're walking in the light, you'll have fellowship with one another. You'll desire to do life with other believers. Fellowship is one of the most exciting things that I'm excited about here moving to this church. For the last 16 years working at Grace Chapel, it was one of my favorite things to be in fellowship with those people. Uh, Last Friday night, they had a big going away party and like over 100 people there, just people who we've done life with, people who we've we've cried with, people that we've, uh, we've been through the valleys and the mountain peaks with, all doing life together. That's what I'm looking forward to here most at this church, that we have fellowship with one another. And then second, we'll see another result. One result is we have fellowship with one another, one another. But the second result is that we are cleansed from sin. If we walk in the light, we are cleansed from sin. More about this in verse 9, but we need to get to the third one, the third if-then statement. If we lie about our sin, then we fool ourselves. If we lie about our sin, we, f- we fool ourselves, we deceive ourselves. Look at this in verse 8 and then also in verse 10 because we'll get to 9 here at the end. 
If we say, <clears throat> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It is, it is a very foolish saying to say, yeah, I am here today with no sin. I do not struggle with sin. No Christian should ever say that. Charles Spurgeon says, he who cannot find water in the sea is not more foolish than the, per, than the man who cannot perceive sin in his members. You catch that, right? You're in the middle of the sea and you can't find water. You're actually smarter than the person who says, yeah, I'm a person and I no longer sin and I can't sin. It's just not true about us. But some people do indeed seem to think that sin is non-existent the way they live their lives. They see sin as merely a mistake. Other people like to quickly rationalize their sin, blame their sin, or make excuses for sin. And this is not a 21st century problem. This happened back in Adam and Eve. You remember when Adam and Eve took the fruit? Remember when God tells Adam, what did you do? And the first things out of his mouth is, well, the woman you gave me gave me the fruit. We, we do this, don't we? We love to blame sin or to, as a defense mechanism, we like to, to blame it on others or we like to minimalize it or we like to make excuses for it. And what John is saying is don't do that. Call sin for what it is. George Morrison, another commentator, says, to wrap yourself up in excuses is to be naked before the great white throne. What an exposing thing a very humiliating thing. To say, I have no sin, I never struggle with sin, is to be uh, at God's mercy. Like, good luck with that type of person. It is not going to go well for them. How do we deceive ourselves? Because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. How does this happen? One is by choosing to ignore the evidence of sin in our lives. So tempting for us not to want to do some heart work on ourselves and say, hey, I need some help. I, I need to get right with the Lord. I need to, I need to go and, and confess to my accountability partner, to my brother, to my sister, to my wife. You ever say anything you know, cruel to your, to your spouse or something short to your kids and then just say, I, I, uh, I'm just going to pretend that time heals that. And I'm just going to let that, I don't want to deal with that, so I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. No, we don't do that as believers. When we sin against each other, we go and we, we confess, we, we seek forgiveness we let sin break our hearts. And then the person that we sin against, we, it breaks our hearts that that relationship has been fractured and we do all that we can to try to work on that. Remember, and I don't have it here in front of me, but Romans 12, 18 says that as far as, as, possi- as, far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. So we strive for peace when we sin against something and, and make, it, make a situation worse. But if we choose to ignore the evidence of sin in our lives, we're like an ostrich. The ostrich is one of the weirdest animals on the planet, right? But when it perceives danger, when it perceives that it's in trouble, what does it do? It sticks its head where? In the ground, right? It just kind of sits there. I forgot I was going to put a picture of an ostrich, but you guys know. That's what it does. It puts its head in the ground and it pretends that the predator is no longer there. It just kind of like, I'm just hoping for the best. And that's what we do as believers. If we choose to ignore sin around us or sin that's going on in our hearts, we're putting our head in the sand, just hoping that it gets dealt with by someone else. It's so silly when we try to do this. We are not immune from sin if we pretend to not sin. Or if we are not immune from sin if we pretend that we do not sin. It actually makes things worse. Secondly, not only do we see of ourselves, but John continues by saying the truth is not in us. When we say we no longer sin or that we don't struggle with sin, we're actually lying. We're lying to others and to God. We cannot claim to be without sin to our unbelieving friends or even to each other. It belittles the need of salvation. When we say we don't need to struggle with sin, what we're doing is looking the gift horse in the mouth and saying, I don't need you. We're saying, Jesus, I don't need you in my life because I don't struggle with sin. It's important for us to to be vocal about this. There are so many unbelievers probably into Larry, who need to hear from Christians, there's an answer to your sin problem. And you know why? Because there's an answer for my sin problem. It's Jesus Christ. We're sinners saved by grace. David Allen says, a dog is not a dog because it barks. It barks because it is a dog. A sinner is not a sinner because he sins. He sins because he's a sinner. 
We are sinners, and thankfully God knows this and has done something about it. This is the good news. Number four, the last if-then statement. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful to forgive us. I need to wrap this up quickly, don't I? Uh, If we confess our sins, then God is faithful to forgive us. Uh, Look at verse nine. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we have finally come to my favorite verse in my favorite passage. It's this verse right here. If you confess, you give your life to Jesus, or if you're as a Christian who's been living in sin, confess and tell God, I don't want this anymore, then he immediately responds with forgiveness. This this verse is very personal for all of us. This verse is emotional. It's the biggest relief to our biggest problem. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful. That's the if then, that's the computer programming part of all of this. If you confess, then God is faithful to do what? To forgive us. If you're a parent and you hear your toddler crying, you act rather quickly. Just on Friday night, it was a pool party kind of dinner, going away party for us. And there was a kid who was on, he was like two-year-old and he was on this like boogie board in the pool and he was close to the edge of the pool. And all of a sudden, like four of us parents, like just instantly reacted to it, right? You ever do this when you see your kid in danger? If your kid cries out, your heart string goes, I need to help that situation right away. That's how God is to us. That's why it is so foolish for us to try and cover our sin or to deny our sin because if we simply confess our sin, he immediately meets us with forgiveness. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? The son, he goes off and he lives this sinful life and then he he puts his head down, he realizes this did not work out and he goes to his father. He's like, I'm just gonna be a servant in my dad's house. I don't even deserve to be a son anymore. Not when he was that far off. The father drops everything that he does and he runs toward the son, embraces the son, hugs the son, loves him, forgives him. That is God to us. This is why Jesus gave that parable, that we would go to him. And if we confess our sins to him, he's so faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Second claim, God loves sinners, verse one and two. Oh, I don't have a lot of time, but this is an, an incredible. You need to hear this. My little children... I am writing these things to you, set you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. A quick reminder about the tone of elderly John. He calls them my little children. John here is not trying to bash them. He's, this is not a letter to try to like, hey, get this right. No, he is a father, he's a grandfatherly figure. He's calling them my little children. And what he's saying is, if you do sin, there's good news for you. TFBC, if you struggle with sin, there's good news for you. There's good news for me. We are loved by God. We should aim to respond with a life of loving him and living for him. We will not do it perfectly, though. So we can endeavor to put a smile on his face. We fall, we know that we will be brought back up. Woody Allen, who is a renowned atheist, he makes it very clear that he's an atheist. One time he was on this panel, this Q&A panel, and someone said, if there is a God, what do you want him to say? And Woody Allen said actually something very profound. He said, well, I would suppose I would want him to say, you are forgiven. David Allen says, John says, the only way you will ever hear from God's the words, you are forgiven, is if you speak the words, I have sinned. You confess, then Jesus gives you forgiveness. What does John call Jesus? He calls him an advocate. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus. An advocate is like an attorney. It is someone who goes to bat for us. It is a relief here in this world, right, if we get into any type of legal trouble, to have an attorney. An attorney who knows the legal jargon, an attorney who can defend you, an attorney who can try to get a jury to rule in your favor. All of us are going to God's court one day. God calls him a judge. All of us are going to his court. But Christians can have a huge sigh of relief knowing that Jesus is our attorney. He is our advocate. Look at these quick verses, Isaiah 33, to remind us that God is a judge. Isaiah 33, verse 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. James chapter four, verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all be 
uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. All of us, before Jesus came into our lives, we stood guilty in God's court. And God knew this about us. And he had compassion on us. And he sent Jesus to be our advocate. Now, I've, I've never met an attorney here on earth that has ever said to a judge, Your Honor, I know my client is guilty, but allow me to carry his sentence on his or her behalf. I will pay for his sentence. I will, I will do the prison time for him. I've never met an attorney that has done that, except for Jesus. That's what Jesus is. Jesus has taken off our handcuffs and he put it on himself. Where did he do that? He did it on the cross. We know the wages of sin is death, right? And Jesus knew this. And as our advocate, he willingly said, I will pay for that person's sin. Jesus lived a perfect life because it was the only way for sinners to be saved. That's why he says back in 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. God still has to punish sin. And he did that by punishing Jesus on the cross on our behalf. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was the spotless lamb because it was the only way for sinners to be saved, for the wrath of God to be satisfied. In Christ alone, one of my wife's favorite hymns says, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Did this sacrifice only work for the disciples? No, but for all generations of Christians. John says, for the sins of the whole world. Jesus' sacrificial death was, made, it was powerful enough to save Peter and per, uh, Paul and Mary and Martha. And it was powerful enough to save Mike and Jeremy and Darcy and Jennifer. Incredible that this, this, this powerful gift of salvation does not deplete over time. It is so powerful. What is our responsibility then in this passage? What is our takeaway? Our takeaway is to confess. Name your sin before God. Have that conversation with him on a daily basis. He wants to hear your struggles. He does not want you to hide them. It is impossible for you to hide them. It is foolish as Adam trying to hide in a cave. It's impossible for us. He's faithful and just to forgive you. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. The enemy says, Don't, you can hide it. No, rest assured your sin will be found out. So confess to him. There's much more I want to say, but time is up. Last couple quotes. Sin will take you, this is D.L. Moody. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Isn't that true? So let's be serious about our battle with sin and serious about relationship with the one who can conquer sin. Allow me to pray. Thanks for watching our Tulare First Baptist YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Also, don't forget about the TFBC app where you can stay connected because we'd sure love to see you on a Sunday morning or at any of our events. May God bless you and have a great day.